People don't hate me, they just hate my behavior. <laughs> Oh, I thought I'd sit down for this one. It's gonna be a long one. Welcome to another epic blaze. A video when I spare, where I spend an hour standing on my feet. I'm gonna move that away or is really gonna annoy me when I edit this video later. Uh, I am just gonna leave it just out of sight so I can sit down if necessary after doing this. Oh, thank you to Brian Richman, who every video, and I think I should make you a moderator of the comments, Brian, because every time I go through and I, I have to find your meme counts where you count every like script slapped and but a boom boom tsh and everything and then I pin it but you do the meme count where you say like this happened this many times at the top you're an absolute legend for doing that but I'm still gonna f with you let's crack on I actually hurt myself I'm such an old man or I've got coronavirus I'm not sure if that'll be funny <laughs> let's carry on this is an epic blaze the 10 inventions that nobody needed <coughs> Thank you, Danny, for writing the script. Thank you, Sam, for editing, editing it. Every now and then, usually after a drink or two, I get incredibly excited about a brilliant new idea for an invention that I just know is gonna change the world. The other week, it was metal detecting slippers. Why not just shoes? This actually sounds like not a bad idea. I mean, the metal detecting dudes are out there, they're walking around, but why does it have to be slippers? Like, for comfort? Uh, I've often seen metal detectorists tiptoeing cautiously around muddy fields or beaches, swinging around those big, long, electronic sticks that make these silly beeping noises. It looks like hard work to me, and usually a massive waste of time anyway. I've mentioned this before on this channel. When I was a kid, I used to work in a newsagents, which is like where... Is that an American term? It's like where you buy magazines. And there was a dude who would come in and he would buy something. I think it was a magazine called The Seeker. And I was like, what the hell is The Seeker? So I eventually bring down The Seeker from the shelf and I read it and it's about metal detecting. And I'm like, the dude who bought this was like the least nerdy guy. He, he looked like, you know, a retired policeman. <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> you? <laughs> These detectorists are dreaming of the day that they uncover the lost hordes of Viking gold or the treasure of Amaro Pago from 1678. That's mighty specific, daddy. They usually have to make do with discovering ring balls from cans of fizzy bob dating as far back as 1983. What a thrill. But wouldn't their hobby be so much easier if they didn't have to swing those electronic sticks about? Well, it's kind of like the hobby though, isn't it? It would be like, well, wouldn't your hobby of mountain biking be a whole lot easier if you were, you know, on a road with an engine and inside a cabin on four wheels listening to some music? And be like, yeah, it would be easier but it takes away from the point. Although I guess the point is the discovery of the metals. I don't know, I'm lost, let's carry on. What if the metal detecting technology was installed into their slippers so that they could go for a relaxing hands-free stroll with the same results? They could use their newly freed hands to eat a lemon curd sandwich, sandwich or drink a can of fizzy pop, which they can later leave behind for future generations of detectorists to discover. Yeah, this is what happened. Hey, stop littering! You're ruining the environment! No, no, no. I'm just littering so that people in the future can Discover this can of coke. It's it's good. Archaeologists love it. I mean, all of those Roman pots and shit, if they'd have thrown them away or like incinerated them, we wouldn't know about the Romans at all. That's how history works, right? I suppose they don't have to be slippers. Depending on the location, the enthusiast could choose to wear metal detecting rubber boots or metal detecting flip flops. I, I mean, the equipment's gonna be quite large though, but it's all academic now anyway. It turns out that somebody beat him to the idea beat Danny to the idea and made a complete hash of it. About 10 years ago, a pair of metal detecting lightning sandals were briefly made available from Hamach Schemmler. A copper coil was embedded, I'm betting Hamach Schemmler is a German Gesellschaft. Uh, Gesellschaft is the only German word I know because I studied uh, a module at uh, university on European law and it was always like so-and-so versus <laughs> Gesellschaft. A common a copper coil was embedded into the right foot, which was connected by a USB port to a bulky battery pack which you had to strap around your calf, making the wearer look a bit like he was a high-risk criminal with a security tag. Sadly, they didn't really work very well. They weren't too bad if you waved a bit of metal directly at the sandal, but the chances of uncovering the Ivory Coast crown jewels buried several feet beneath the surface was basically zero. I do feel like Danny, you know, you're making fun of the metal detectorologists, but you also have a strong knowledge of hidden gems. Maybe you've missed your calling. Still, I like to think that the idea was perfectly sound. It's just that the technology maybe hasn't caught up with such ingenious thinking. And that's got to be more forgivable than investing huge amounts of time and money and resources into products that absolutely nobody in the world even asked for. And this begins 
our epic blaze with number one, Microsoft Bob. I perfectly understand why kids are far more likely to absorb useful information if it's delivered to them by fictional characters. Back when I was a kid, I learned how to cross the road safely by watching a series of road TV advertisements featuring the Green Cross Code Man. I remember that. F a superhero character in a green and white costume played by Darth Vader himself, Dave Prowse. Really? <laughs> That's like the time I found out that uh, the dude from the Beatles, uh, Ringo Starr, was the voice of Thomas the Tank Engine. It's like, you were Darth Vader, Dave. One day it's gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna be doing the, the voice of, you know, the next station is Ashford International. Actually, that would be kind of cool. I feel like it would be a bit of a step down. In the commercials, it would magically pop up on the street just in the nick of time to stop a couple of dozy children from carelessly walking into the middle of the road and getting mowed down by traffic. Wait, that just sounds like it sends the message that he's gonna save you when you wander into traffic. <laughs> he would then run through a, base, a few basics of the Green Cross Code, which was loads of boring rubbish about stopping and thinking and looking and using your ears and then stopping and thinking again. Oh my god, I'm already lost. How did the children keep track? I can't remember much about it now. Maybe this is why I used to run over by the ice cream van so often. Poor Danny. <laughs> in a situation that echoed his role as Darth Vader in Star Wars, Dave Prowse played the body of the Green Cross Man but wasn't allowed to provide the voice in the early commercials. This was dubbed over by another actor because Dave Prowse has a funny accent. Poor guy. <laughs> uh, I also didn't know that, Dave, that, that Darth Vader was dubbed over, but then again I've never seen Star Wars so why would I? <laughs> But anyway, my point is that all of this kind of thing is fine for kids who don't know any better yet. But it's surely not necessary for grown-ups who should have developed a capacity to absorb useful information without the need for silly characters to guide them through the process. Yes, it is kind of insulting, isn't it? Where it's like, it, Clippy is the absolute golden example of this. It looks like you're trying to write a letter. Yeah, I am, Clippy, and I know how to write a f to you, ass. Did you mean to put the date on the right? Yes, Clippy, that's how we do it in the UK. It appears that nobody sent the memo to Microsoft. Microsoft Bob was a bit before my time. That's not an indicator of my age, I just mean that I hadn't got a proper PC yet. This was before even Windows 95. I think Windows 90, no, I had Windows 3.1, was super early, but I do remember not having Windows. I had something called Magic Desktop, and before that, just had to operate everything through DOS, which was a massive pain in the ass. Uh, Microsoft Bob was meant to be a colorful social interface software package for novices in which cute cartoon characters would guide you through the tricky process of using a computer for the first time. Now, I do think that this could be useful for some people, like I think about, you know, my more elderly relatives. It was an attempt to turn your desktop into a house full of lots of different rooms populated by helpful characters and a big graphic of familiar objects that represented desktop applications. So you click on a notebook on a desk to open a simple word processor. You click on a calendar hanging on the wall to open up a calendar. You click on a grandfather clock to, well, I'm sure you get the idea. Wait, isn't this just like a normal desktop? You just click on it. It's like, I mean, I can read. It says calendar. <laughs> it's also got a picture of a calendar. My first question when looking through the application today is who and where the f is Microsoft Bob? We appear to be in Bob's house, but Bob himself is nowhere to be seen. So I assume that the user is taking on the role of a burglar rifling through Bob's personal belongings. The main character is actually Rover the dog, who bounces around the floors of the house and occasionally provides speech bubbles packed with handy tips and suggestions such as to open a program, click on it. Yeah, no f shit, Rover. You think I'm f stupid? I'll kick your ass! And then people will be like, Simon, don't abuse virtual dogs. They're as real as real dogs. And as we all know, real dogs are more important than people. I, fair, I feel there was an animated dog in later versions, like a 3D animated dog. You wouldn't be in like Bob's house. But it would just pop up on the pop up on the desk desktop like an even more dumbass clippy. I thought that was annoying as well. But there were other equally wacky guides along the way too, such as Lecky the Bes Lexi the Bespectacled Badger, who helps with accounting. Hank the Purple Elephant, who guides you through Geo Safari application. Scuzz the Sewer Rat, who seems to spend most of his time ignoring you and just rummaging through garbage cans. This is super weird. Badgers are well known for their maths. The obvious problem with all of this is that it would only appeal to kids who are under seven years of age. Your average computer novice just wants to be clearly and simply shown how to do things. You don't need cartoon animals pissing about and scratching themselves and wagging their tails and playing around with footballs while you're trying to figure out how to open a spreadsheet. The whole thing just came across as patronizing drivel. Those green code man adverts for young kids honestly had more maturity and credibility than Microsoft Bob. Another problem was the original retail price of $100? What are you buying? This wasn't for free? That's a <laughs> Yeah, I've bought Windows 95, but the uh, the help manual is $100 <laughs> and it's sh uh, those software packages, it does seem a tad expensive. Especially with inflation. This was like Windows 95, 1995. That's 25 years of inflation. That's got to be what? 
At least 200 bucks today. That's insane. Windows is like 200 bucks. Although, like, paying for Windows, right? I built my own PC and I downloaded Windows and then they were like, yeah, you got to register Windows. And I'm like, okay, I'll get to it. You know, however long, you know, they're going to hassle me and then it'll stop working. So that's when I'll do it. It's been two years. I'm still using Windows. <laughs> I don't know what's... It just says at the bottom right hand corner of the screen, I'm looking at my computer. It just says activate Windows. And I'm like, why? <laughs> it, it seems to be working completely fine, Microsoft. Am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> I didn't pirate it. I downloaded it from the official Microsoft website. Uh, there was also the problem that it didn't run on basic PCs and you needed a higher spec PC. Oh God. <laughs> Microsoft Bob and his pals died before the end of the year to make way for Windows 95, although this sadly wasn't represented uh, on screen by all of those sickeningly cute characters suddenly keeling over from a heart attack when you were trying to compose an email. That'd be great. I feel like Microsoft missed a trick when they could have like brutally murdered Clippy. Uh, I feel like there was, there was enough cartoons and memes about that. So at least Microsoft would have learned a valuable lesson from this. We know they didn't because Clippy came later and they would have surely thought twice about ever including another silly character to act as an annoying interface for their latest bit of software. We'll come back to that thought later in today's video. I'm already excited. Stay tuned. Give me that sweet, sweet watch time. Incidentally, although Microsoft Bob's lifespan was less than one year, it left behind a legacy of a very different kind that lasted long into the future. The Comic Sans typeface was originally created by Microsoft designer Vincent Conair, who is, <laughs> I guess, now hated by every designer everywhere, <laughs> specifically for inclusion in the Microsoft Bob software. It's not hard to see why it probably would have made a perfect fit and it was the only place it would be a perfect fit. He sadly couldn't complete the typeface in time, so it was never included in the package, but Comic Sans went on to become perhaps one of the most hated and inappropriately used fonts in history. Just blame Bob. Number two, the radio newspaper. Traveling further back in time, to the 1930s. American newspapers were beginning to feel deeply concerned about this newfangled radio invention. I get the feeling the radio newspaper isn't gonna be something as cool as like, you know, those podcasts where they tell you the news. Um, it's probably gonna be a bit because nobody wanted it. And we all know that podcasts kind of mega successful, except for my podcast, The Simon Whistler Show, which I'll link to below. Or maybe I won't. Maybe I'm just gonna be trolling you with a Rick Astley link. You will find out. They were obviously worried that readers would become less interested in going to the effort of buying a physical newspaper full of last night's news when they could just twiddle a few knobs on this chunky new futuristic device and get the very latest news beamed instantly into their living rooms. It, it does amaze me. Like, newspapers, they were worried about going out of business in the 1930s and they're worried about going out of business today. It'll be like 2130 and we'll be having news like beamed directly into our brains through this Elon Musk neural link and people will be like, oh, well, I, still, I still get a paper. It's like, you Weirdo. <laughs> At the time, many leading newspapers were even refusing to print radio program schedules in their pages. They believed that such a move would be only helping to seal their own fate. I can understand that. Ah, uh, so I'm not sure how newspaper editors would have felt about the arrival of radio newspaper in 1938. Some may have believed that the radio was now muscling in on their print business too, while others may have seen the potential for getting their own newspapers directly into the homes of their customers without anybody having to trudge down to the shops. Wait, how do you... Well, I guess we're going to find out. Uh, the concept of radio facsimile transmission is largely credited to William G. H. Finch. The idea was that you'd have a radio receiver in your home which would be attached to special thermal printing paper. Wait, are we faxing people newspapers in like the 1930s? That's actually incredible. The radio facsimile edition of a newspaper would be transmitted by commercial radio stations in the very early hours of the morning when they weren't busy trying to broadcast proper radio programs. Didn't they do this with games back in the day? So that they'd broadcast the code, the computer code, through a radio, and then you could record it onto a tape or some insanity like that. I think we did a video about it ages ago, and it blew my mind. People also point out, like, sometimes they'll be like, yeah, Simon, of course you know about this. You did a video about it. And I'll be like, yeah, I did a video about it in 2017. It's been three years and 4,000 videos later. Uh... <laughs> Cut me some slack, chaps. This would be picked up by your home radio receiver and then slowly printed onto a continuous roll of thermal paper, which could then be cut and folded until your DIY newspaper was ready to be fully absorbed over a couple of boiled eggs and buttered pancakes at the breakfast table. This is well ahead of its time. I remember in the 90s when printers, like home printers, were really becoming a thing for the first time, like an affordable consumer product. 
and the newspapers would be advertising about just print out your newspaper. And I was like, wow, this is <laughs> like looking back on that today, it's like that was wasteful. Let's print our newspaper articles onto really high quality paper. It's good iPads came along, right? Smash that dislike button, Samsung Master Race. Sorry, I should say Android Master Race. Samsung is is not is not just Samsung, it's the whole like Android Master Race. From the perspective of the far-sighted newspaper editor, this could have developed into quite a handy way to distribute papers into homes while passing all printing and distribution costs over to the customer. Yeah, but I mean one of the reasons we didn't all stop printing our newspapers in the 90s is because we're like, oh, printer ins expensive, and I bet this facsimile paper is not for free. It's the 1930s and it's a fax machine. You're gonna have to be like Howard Hughes or something have this. But it never really took off, mainly because nobody really ever asked for it. The first problem was the expense. Danny and I. Same page, always. Simon, Danny and Sam. The magic trio of business place. It would cost literally thousands of today's dollars to get this equipment installed in your home, and even then you'd have to keep regularly topping up your expensive supplies of thermal paper. The process of printing your radio newspaper was painfully slow and incredibly noisy. It usually took about six hours to print out a complete edition of a single newspaper. Oh my god, I, I just imagine it being printed on like receipt sized paper, so you'd be like going through it like, oh yes, fascinating. <laughs> This might not have been quite so bad if it wasn't happening during the early hours of the morning. In other words, the whole household would be kept awake at night as your printer got to work bringing you the latest headlines. It'd be like, guys, just listen to the radio like a normal person or buy a newspaper. I mean, it's an amazing idea, but it's just too far ahead of its time. I said that about electric cars the other day. Uh, in a general sense, and I really meant it just for me because I don't have a power. Um, I live in a city, I live in an apartment, so I have a garage, but it's not powered. I have a parking space, but it's also not powered. So where am I supposed to park like an electric car and charge it up? There's not enough superchargers, there's not enough electrical parking on the street. I also don't want to park my street car on the street because it's going to get dinged the shit because I live in a city. It's just not the time for me. I think electric cars are awesome. I very much hope that I will be driving an electric car in five years. Therefore, I will exclusively drive Hummers because I really want to get all my carbon burned burning in now, so I could, you know, don't have to worry about burning it all later. The radio transmission was vulnerable to static, which would often completely cock up the radio facsimile, and even when it worked properly, the final newspaper was quite small and generally just not as good as a proper newspaper. It's difficult to understand how any reader would have thought that splashing out all this money and equipment that kept you awake at night to produce a substandard version of a newspaper which you then had to assemble yourself was in any way preferable to buying a real newspaper. 100%! And not many people did. However, Although it may sound now like a fairly absurd invention, the radio newspaper can now be seen as one of the first steps towards the development of the fax machine, which ended up becoming a lot more useful. <laughs> I was customizing a menu on Windows 10 the other day. You know, the, when you right click and you click send to, and it's like, send a fax. And I was like, who is using this? <laughs> Fax machines have not been a thing in my lifetime. I think maybe some people when I was a kid, if their dad had an office at home, they would have a fax machine in there. But it was weird. And I was like, what's a fax machine? <laughs> Number three, maybe the Juicero Press? I feel like the name is already not brilliant. If you're the kind of person who enjoys the idea of drinking freshly squeezed farm fresh fruit and vegetable juice, but can't be asked with any of that dangerous chopping up or the hassle of cleaning up after yourself, the Juicero Press may well have been for you. This actually sounds pretty good. I mean, I'd definitely do the vegetable stuff, but like the one about like fruit drinks, where it's like, yeah, it's uh, it's blended fruit. It's good for you. It's like it's got like six bananas in it and like seven oranges. Do you have any, any idea how much sugar that is? And you're just blending it up? Yeah, just have a can of Coke. Really? I mean, it's probably got less sugar. It's like, does your liver really know a difference? <laughs> the California. I feel like juice is just the biggest empty calorie ever. It's like I'd much rather have like a delicious piece of Kentucky Fried Chicken which is, I don't know, however many hundreds of calories, rather than like, oh, also Starbucks drinks. It's like, yeah, this one contains 1,600 calories. I'd much rather have food. The California-based company Juicero, of course it was based in California, uh, launched their press uh, in 2013 with an original retail price of $700. This is the most Californian thing I have ever heard. The idea was that you bought vacuum-sealed packets of pre-pulped and cold-pressed fruit and vegetables directly from the Juicero company. Oh god, this is the most, like, you know you know everyone's rich when this is what's happening, right? You've run out of problems. Then you shoved them into your shiny new $700 bit of kit which contains the cutting edge technology that would quickly squeeze the packets and pour out a perfect glass 
of healthy hipster juice. The Juiceri Press came equipped with, equipped with Wi-Fi capabilities, because of course it did. In fact, the machine would stubbornly refuse to work unless it was hooked up to a Wi-Fi connection. Oh my lord. This initially confused me a little bit, but it turns out that there were reasonably valid health reasons behind the concept. I can't possibly imagine what this could be. What is the possible health reason behind needing your juicer to connect to the internet. Each packet of cold pressed goodness had a very short lifespan and came with a QR code, which the Juicero Press needed to scan to verify online to make sure that the ingredients were still on date. Only then would it fully commit to squeezing the fresh packet on your behalf. I don't want to discount this incredible piece of technology, but there is this thing we've had for a while, which is called a, um, oh, a sell by date. Just put that on there. Not hard, is it? Or you open it up. <laughs> oh, it smells like sh Let's not eat it. Or, yeah, it smells good. Let's juice this f What are we doing? <laughs> oh, Juicero managed to drum up 120 million. I'm f out. I Why aren't I just making a Juicero press? Where's my 120 million? <laughs> Business Blaze is more useful for the than this. And Business Blaze has very little utility, let's be frank. Uh, they rather, so $120 million comes from Kleiner Perkins and Alphabet. That's the company that owns Google, which owns YouTube, which owns me. <laughs> sort of. Technically. Hello, business daddy. Now I love the Juicero Press. It's the best. Why is this not a massive success? It's because it's, it's a sh yeah. Uh, they got off to a flying start with the development of their new products that hadn't been on sale very long before they started to s before they slashed the price tag to four hundred dollars due to a lack of interest. What a surprise! Yeah. Also, it was like, yeah, it's now four hundred dollars. I like so what that three hundred. You're still profitable, <laughs> and that three hundred dollars was just you bilking me a little bit extra because I'm a Californian hipster. Although, I, I've made comments before that this is my midlife crisis outfit, you know, the blazer over a casual t-shirt, and someone was like, oh, I think you're a California hipster. The exact person who would buy a Juicero press. I think it would be quite funny if I bought one of these, right? <laughs> Although they won't work anymore because you need the special packets, and uh, I guess they just... You, these must sell for like nothing. However, whether you're willing to pay $700 or $400, it's still quite a bit of work to fork, it's still quite a bit to fork out for a Wi-Fi juicer. You're also a clown. And the small packets of Juicero fruit and vegetables cost up to $8 a go. Why not just go to the juice place then? Why not just, you could order it off at Uber Eats and it would cost this much. $8 for juice? I would never pay this. If I was thirsty in the desert, if it had been, like I've been trekking through the Sahara for many days and I'd had to like drink the blood of my compatriot to stay alive. And then there was like a juice bar and it was like $8. I'd be like, no, I'm good. So this was always going to be a very expensive way of getting your juice fix. The other slight flaw in this business model was revealed in a 60 second video produced by Bloomberg News in 2017. Although Juicero claimed that their press was the only machine on earth capable of squeezing these vacuum sealed packets and transforming them into a juice drink, it turned out this wasn't quite true. Bloomberg showed how you could achieve a very similar effect by just throwing the press in the bin and squeezing out the juice packet with your own human hands. Wait, so he's not even juicing it? It's just taking a juice, the juice out of a packet? What the f is going on? The Juicero Press quickly became a target for online mockery. Good. Uh, now that it's been revealed that the company had been charging hundreds of dollars. Charging hundreds of dollars doesn't quite <laughs> capture the $700 that this machine went for. Uh, for a machine that did pretty much the same job as your hands. But you don't want to get your, like, beautiful hipster programming hands I don't know, I just imagine that all hipsters in California are programmers. Or they own coffee shops. I'm basing this largely on that TV show Silicon Valley and that TV show Flaked. You can't help feeling that the company just approached this in an absurdly complicated way. As they were already going to the trouble of acquiring and processing these fruits and vegetables, they may have well, as well have done the squeezing on their end too. Then they could have dumped the silly Wi-Fi machine and instead just shipped the products as instant fruit and vegetable drinks. Yeah, but then how are you gonna rip people off so well? That I mean, this is the best invention ever. Thank you, Alphabet. You're the best. I suppose that there would have been no novelty factor in that concept though, and less chance of a $120 million funding round from old Silicon Valley. Absolutely nailed it, daddy. Uh, although the CEO of Juicero was initially defiant in his defense of the Juicero press, of course he was, and claimed that squeezing his company's packets by hands was messy and mediocre, he eventually offered full refunds for anyone who had bought the press and the company went out of business less than five months later. Well, that's pretty solid. I wonder what happened to the 120 mil. Doesn't matter. It's not here. We're moving on. Uh, the pause pod. Every now and again, a product comes along that changes the world as we know it. 
The pause pod wasn't one of these. In 2017, a Swedish company launched the pause pod with an original retail tag of just $200, following the funding campaigns on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So I recently tried out a Swedish product. I went to test drive a Volvo and I was mostly like, I, I can't park. I like never really learned how to park properly. So I can't parallel park. I'm parking. I always have to drive in nose first and then I'm at a weird angle. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get a car that parks itself. So I go to test drive a Volvo and I drive into the parking lot and I'm like, okay, I want to park it. And the guy's like, oh, no, 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 I'll park it for you. And I'm like, no, 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 I want to try out this self-parking feature. And so I drive past the two parking spots with the sensors on the right. And I've turned it on and I'm driving past and it's like looking for spaces. And there's a huge space looking for spaces. It detects nothing. And so I drive on and I'm like, it didn't do a very good job, did it? And he was like, oh, well, we turned it on after the parking space. And I'm like, but we didn't, did we? And so I'm like, all right, I'm just going to reverse this guy up. I'm just going to reverse it all the way up. And uh, let's just go past it again. And I'm going past it really close. There's really slow and it completely misses it. And he's like, oh, well, it needs lines to see where the parking is. Because it was like, it wasn't properly demarcated. And I'm like, well, you could have said that before. Because now it just feels like you're lying to try and get me to buy this car. If anyone has a Volvo, uh, you know, one of the new ones that parks itself and all that shit. Let me know if this is actually good, because I walked out of that sales lot being like, I'm going to stick with a car that I have to park myself, I guess, right? Because <laughs> this situation is going to be, I'm going to be you trying to use the sensors, I'm going to get really pissed off, and then I'm going to have to park the car anyway, which is a frustration, rather than just having to park the car anyway, which is a frustration. Let me know. Uh, it was going to cost the pause pod, f I'm so lost. The pause pod was going to cost $200. Uh, following Indiegogo and Kickstarter campaigns. Does anything actually work on those? Like, I, I, I got excited about a couple of Kickstarter campaigns, and then I had to wait six months to get something that I already paid for, and it turned out to be kind of shit. So, and I've never done Indiegogo. The pause pod promised to be the world's first private pop-up space suitable for all of your relaxation needs. All right, suitable for the home, the office, or a coronavirus-infected tram is often what I think about these days. I take the public transport to work. It's like, someone's like, Bleh! I'm like, oh, I'm already a hypochondriac and it's like, I'm going to get coronavirus. I'll be fine. I'm 32. I'm going to make all the old people around me die. On that cheery note, this episode's going to date really badly. <laughs> Suitable for the home, the office. Oh, we read that already. Uh, or a busy road if you're loony enough to buy one of these things. The product was made of light reducing fabric. This could be set, it could be set up and dismantled in minutes. It even came with some funky optional add-ons like ear masks, earmuffs, eye masks, and a picture of a starry sky which you could attach to the ceiling of your pause pot and a pause cinema which sounds amazing but it was actually just a mount for your iPad. The main problem here is that the designers of the pause pot had actually gone and invented the tent and they were literally thousands of years late to the party. The marketing campaigns were also bordering on the unorthodox with one promotional image on Twitter depicting a man chilling out in a pause pod which appears to have been set up right in front of his bed. <laughs> Dude, just get into the bed. I agree. I want to look at this thing. Danny, I feel disappointed that this is not a picture. Pause pod. Oh, it's not even a tent, it's a tent. Oh, it is a tent, but your body, what the f Can you imagine what a you have to be to do that? You have to be such an entitled It's essentially like a half tent. Let's, let's, let's just move on from this. I feel slightly uncomfortable around it. The company rightfully received a roasting on social media and on business plays several years after the fact. You're welcome. But one of the inventors defended the product saying, we never claimed that it wasn't a tent. All right, <laughs> that doesn't really seem like a defense of it being shite. It's like the other guy with the juice press. Yeah, we never really claimed it wasn't a ripoff. <laughs> Microsoft Bob. Yeah, we never really said that it wasn't completely shite. It's not an excuse. <laughs> and it looks as if the Scandinavian design team may have had the last laugh. Although it now looks as if the item is permanently out of stock, the inventors claim to have sold 2,000 of these things at $200 a go. I'd like to think that the same team are currently working on new hipster of the bouncy castle. I'd like to think that they've been banished from ever doing business again. Let's move on. The Sinclair C5. UK inventor and entrepreneur, Sir Clive Sinclair, is probably one of my biggest all-time heroes. However, his story is quite crushing in a way. He's not one of my heroes. I've heard his name. <laughs> I honestly don't know who he is. <laughs> I should read these beforehand so I can sound smart. The, his greatest 8-bit invention, which lit up the lives of millions of kids across the UK, left Sir Clive Sinclair himself feeling a bit disappointed, while his one true passion ended up becoming a laughable flop. Back in the 1980s, one way of trying to persuade your parents to buy a home computer was to convince them that it would be useful for your school homework. Naturally, you wouldn't really want to do your homework on it unless you were out of your f 
mind. The real reason he wanted a home computer was to play games on it. Yeah, this was <laughs> always use the computer for work. That's the primary use of the computer. Nowadays, the sad thing is I've become such an adult that I have this kick-ass PC for like editing videos and stuff. And it's like absolute gaming monster. And I never play games because I have no time. Because I spend all my time making one hour long videos for some reason. <laughs> Even though it's against all good advice on YouTube to make a video an hour long, like an idiot. Uh, uh So Clive had already developed the world's pocket first pocket electronic calculator in 1972 and turned to the home computer market in the 1980s. His crowning achievement was the Sinclair ZX Spectrum in 1982. And I pronounce it the British way because Sir Clive is obviously British. He's a sir. He's a knight. It was a small, odd-looking thing with weird rubber keys and not so much as a joystick port, but it was very much affordable. Well, even as a kid, I had one, so it must have been. I didn't have one of these. Uh, it was the 1980s, so it was before my time. So Clive's intent was that the ZX Spectrum would be seen as a serious computer. At the time, the BBC was on a mission to lend a financial helping hand to get computers into the classrooms of the UK. Several are uh, computers in classrooms now a kid sitting there with tablets and laptops because i remember when i was at school 20 years ago it was like oh yeah soon everyone's gonna be using tablets we won't have textbooks we won't have notebooks we'll just all be sitting there with laptops when i was at university some people had laptops now i guess everyone does because i watch movies the schools in the uk and the us is everyone sitting there with a laptop now several tech companies were competing to win the bbc's big grant to become the official provider of computers for schools in the uk the bbc is the bbc what are you doing this isn't your job <laughs> the client believed that a zx spectrum was the ideal machine on which future generations could learn their way around a computer Sadly, his company ultimately lost out to Acorn Electronics. I remember Acorn. I believe I had an Acorn. Which meant that millions of British school kids ended up learning boring stuff on Acorn's rubbish BBC Micro. Is this a different BBC? <laughs> it's probably a different BBC, isn't it? Then everyone went home and played games on their cool ZX Spectrums. The ZX Spectrum may have looked odd, but it was a deeply wonderful computer and competed strongly against America's Commodore 64. I've heard of that. It went on to shift over 5 million units, and about 12,000 games were released for the machine. Wow! I've probably played most of them, and I'm still playing on them today. The greatest game of all, and I seem to be missing half my script. I'll be right back. Okay, apparently my printer was like, Simon, you don't need most of the pages from this script, do you? Just, uh... It did feel a bit light for what was going to be an epic blaze. I've got two more pages here, but they're clearly at the end. So I'm going to have to switch to my old tablet, and we're going to be doing less of that. This is, uh, what environmentally friendly business blaze will look like when Greta Thunberg finally sues me. Okay, where are these business blaze scripts? The greatest game of all. This is so weird. I feel so weird doing this. The greatest game of all time is a ZX Spectrum game called Manic Miner, but it took me about 30 years to complete. complete. Games were harder in those days. Never heard of it. But Sir Clive was ultimately a little disheartened that his serious personal home computer had pretty much evolved into nothing more than a games console. During financial difficulties in 1986, he ended up selling off the company's products to Alan Sugar's Amstrad. He's the guy, I think I've mentioned this before, he's like Donald Trump in the UK. I mean, he's not the Prime Minister. He was the host of The Apprentice. Can't see Alan Sugar becoming the Prime Minister. He's low. He's from Amstrad and he spent the next few years burying Sinclair's glorious vision into the ground until everybody got bored and bought Nintendos and Mega Drives instead. It is interesting, like, just to return to that, that Donald Trump used to be, like, a reality TV star. Ronald Reagan was a movie star. Our Prime Ministers are always, like, career politicians who've never done anything interesting before. It's like, what did you do before? I was a, I was a barrister. <laughs> I was a scientist. It's like, you did things for smart people. Come on. I'd like just one reality TV star. Or like a Spice Girl. That'd be fun. However, by this time, Sir Clive Sinclair had already moved on to his true passion, electric vehicles. Launched in 1985, the Sinclair C5, often labelled as an electric car, but technically it's more of an electric battery and pedal-powered tricycle. <laughs> Sounds a bit shite, doesn't it? Uh, the driver sits in a low-down open cockpit, steering the wheel with handlebars positioned underneath your knees and pushing the pedals with your feet uh, if the electric battery has run out. There's also a handy track trunk at the back for your luggage, although I suspect you wouldn't be travelling very far in one of those. I have no idea what this looks like. It looks like this. How does it have the steering below your knees? That sounds insanely uncomfortable. I mean, this whole thing sounds terrible, but... Oh my. Oh, it looks good. Oh, oh no. This definitely looks like just a, a buggy for adults. Oh wow, so your, your hands are kind of down by your butt. This is, this looks terrible, Clive. Many other prestigious companies collaborated on the product. We seem to give it some initial credibility. The polypropylene body and chassis were designed by none other than Lotus cars. They make some cool looking cars. And I think the original Tesla was actually built on a Lotus body. 
uh, I mean, their prototypes or whatever. Whilst production of the vehicle was overseen by the Hoover Company. Of course it was. Who else would you want to make your cars other than the vacuum cleaner company? Right. This may go some way to explaining why the electric transport of tomorrow looked more like a budget vacuum cleaner than a roadworthy vehicle, yes. <laughs> Cheesy TV commercials went to great lengths to promote the benefits of this £399 electric tricycle. I mean, it's cheap for a car. It's not cheap for a bike or a tricycle. Also, do adults ride tricycles? Someone would be like, Simon, I got you a tricycle. I'd be like, have you confused me for a child? No driving license or road tax was required. Bloody well better not be. <laughs> It could drive you five miles for a penny without the need for petrol. And you could drive it whether you were 14 or 40. The last bit now just seems a bit ageist. Uh, you're no longer capable of pushing pedals after the, you've hit the age of 40. That's only eight years from now for me. <laughs> that does feel a bit a little like, oh, well, I guess you're over the hill then, Simon. <laughs> but there were several advantages not mentioned in the TV advertising. For starters, it tends to rain quite a bit in Britain. It certainly does. So driving around in an exposed cockpit will inevitably mean that you're not that you're going to get pissed on at some point. Cock and piss. But a bum bum. I got to use the old script. It's not the same without it, is it? But a bum bum. The electric battery only lasted for 15 minutes, so it wouldn't be all that long before you'd be forced to rely on good old-fashioned battery pedal power until you could recharge the battery again. And I remember, like, now I feel batteries charge relatively quickly. I remember back in the day, I had, like, one of those uh, remote-controlled cars. And it'd be like, you'd have 20 minutes of epic fun with a remote control car, then you'd have to go and charge the battery for half a day. <laughs> and it'd be like, great, okay. One of the biggest problems of all, though, is that you just look like a prat driving around in a white plastic bucket. It's incredibly true. But an even bigger problem was the perceived safety. <laughs> yeah, what safety? You see the picture, there's nothing. If you got hit by a car, you're just gonna be a puddle of, like, bones. <laughs> Can bones make a puddle? Or, like, blood? Blood and bones together with organs and skin. Getting way too graphic, I'm gonna get demonetized. Not many people would have dared taking one of these things out into busy traffic because your silent low-down vehicle is likely to slip beneath the sight lines of other drivers. If you were ever sandwiched between two massive trucks, it's easy to imagine how things could get messy really quickly. Yes, there would be horrible death. Hilariously, there was a grave concern at the time from critics who believed that the Sinclair C5 could end up being adopted as the vehicle of choice for gangs of 14-year-olds who would use them to knock down old ladies and terrorize the neighborhoods. This feels like an imaginary fear of old people. <laughs> but there was nothing to worry about. No self-respecting 14-year-old would be seen dead in one of these because it would make them look like a knob. Indeed. Although, when I was 14, I lived in the middle of the countryside. My nearest friend was 45 minutes riding my bike away. It was a pain. Like, I'd, to get to his house, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back. It was a huge pain in the ass. I would have liked one of these. My parents would be like, you're not having that, you'll get killed. And I'd be like, okay. Also, they're 400 pounds. Where are 14 year olds gonna get 400 pounds? Especially the 14 year olds who rove around in gangs causing trouble. It's like the only 14 year olds who has 400 pounds would be like, oh yes, well, where are we going? We're going to play croquet. <laughs> Ultimately, the C Sinclair C5 was sold as an alternative to cars and bikes when the reality was that everyone preferred to just stick with cars and bikes. <laughs> only around 5,000 of the vehicles were ever sold at the time, although they have since gone on to become a novelty collector's item and are now fetching thousands of pounds on eBay. Good lord, I wouldn't mind one myself just for a bit of a laugh, although I'd probably paint mine in racing car red. Tell you what, if this video gets, I don't know, what's an absurdly high number? Because I once said it was gonna get a thousand likes where this channel had four subscribers and then it did get a thousand likes. Uh, if I get a hundred thousand likes on this video, no, that seems too low because there's like 50,000 subscribers. So I can imagine in like a year that happening. If he gets 150,000 likes, which I deem as fairly impossible, within the next two years, I'll buy one of these. <laughs> And uh, I won't paint it red because I'm not good at painting, but if I can get it shipped here. Otherwise, I'll just have to go to the UK and uh, ride it all the way here. That would be terrible. Over 35 years on, Sir Clive Sinclair is still messing about with folding bicycles and sea scooters, and I don't know, probably flying wheelchairs. I just wish it stuck to pocket calculators and computers. But a boom boom Smalt. Never heard of this. Have you? <laughs> probably a reason for it. We're gonna find out that reason. Have you ever wished you could do a bit more with your salt shaker? No. No, I have not. If the answer is yes, it's not. Then maybe you should stop for a few minutes and consider where you're heading in life. Uh, but leave this moment of reflection until after you've finished the video because we all love that watch time. But Danny has some good news for us. Priced, priced at a bargain. $199. The brand new Smalt is billed as the world's first interactive centerpiece and smart salt dispenser designed to enhance your dining experience. Oh god, this is gonna be another one of these, isn't it? It's gonna be like that stupid tent thing. Or the juicer. I don't know why these, like, get to me so much more than like, oh yeah, it's a bike. Cool. 
The other one is like, yeah, it's a juicer that doesn't juice. Uh, that's quite a lot to digest in one sitting. Bada bum bum -tsh. So let's unpack this slowly before we all wet ourselves with excitement. The battery powered smalt shaker. Has Danny included a link for me? See image of smalt shaker. Come on, Danny, include them in line with the text. Normally when I print them out, I feel good about wasting all my printer ink. Let's see what this magical image is. Oh, it looks like a Alexa or something like that. Who's sitting down? Four people drinking red wine and white wine at the same time, perfectly leveled out, and has this magical glowing device on their table. Whose life is this? It can hook up to an app on your smartphone to deliver the ultimate salt dispensing experience. This is something that a recession is gonna destroy, right? <laughs> By accessing the app settings, you can determine the exact amount of salt the device will dispense every single time. Just shake or pinch your smartphone screen manually, or turn the little dial on your smalt to dispense these perfectly measured servings of salt. Yes, it could be argued that you could achieve a fairly similar effect by just using a spoon and your human human eyes to determine <laughs> I want to slap this so bad to determine the amount of salt you want to sprinkle on your fries but where's the fun in that it gets better the smalt also comes equipped with a Bluetooth speaker for streaming music and beautiful color changing mood lighting to add an extra layer of luxurious ambient to your magical salt munching movements who's like oh you know what add ambience to my dining room table an LED powered salt shaker it doesn't <laughs> That doesn't add ambience, that adds kitsch. One slight missed opportunity here is that the excessive piece of kit doesn't actually grind salt, it merely dispenses it. What? So what's the battery? The battery is just there to power all the sh** you don't need. It doesn't even grind it. A much bigger problem is that the design of the battery only lasts for four hours. <laughs> and the smalt won't actually dispense any salt until it's charged up again. I got a bin in the kitchen which you walk up to it and it opens automatically. And I was like, I don't need this, but my wife was like, we should get this. And I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna argue. And I have to say, it's incredible. And you change the battery on that thing. Like, I'm always throwing in, because I hate the environment. I'm always like, oh, look at all this plastic. Shove that in there. But it's always, I've changed the battery twice, ever. And I asked my wife, because normally I just assume that if it's working really well, she's doing it. And she's like, no, I haven't changed it. I changed it once. It's been like two years. It's incredible. It was also like 200 pounds or something insane. And I'm like, really? 200 pounds on a bin wife? Come on, what the f But it's really good, she was correct. So salt won't actually dispense until it's charged up again. <laughs> so if you've invited your posh friends around for dinner, you could end up looking like a complete cockwomble by encouraging them to use a fancy $200 salt dispenser, which is completely incapable of dispensing salt. Although it's not available yet, you can currently register your interest in owning your very own smalt and get put on the waiting list with the possibility of a 50% early bird discount. I kind of want it to have on this channel and absolutely rip into it so hard. Or company, if you want to send me one, I'll have a look at it. For the full on twat effect, make sure that you fill it right to the top with pink Himalayan salt. If you understand that joke, thank you for being an OG business blaze legend. Let's move on. Lift, shuttle, L-Y-F-T, because we can't spell things normally in what I assume is gonna be Silicon Valley. Ride-sharing platforms like Uber and Lyft, of course it's Silicon Valley, it's this Lyft company, um, may well have shaken up the taxi industry without actually making any profit yet or paying its drivers a decent wage, as we discovered. In a recent Business Blaze video, we used maths and science and statistics and guessing. Fuck you, science. To figure out that the average Uber driver gets paid about $9.73 an hour, which is some way off the 90,000 years a dollar that the company originally claimed. Yeah, this was brilliant. They were like, yeah, our Uber drivers make up to $90,000 a year. And it's like, no, they don't. They just don't. And we can demonstrate this fairly easily. <laughs> but in the summer of 2017, Lyft dared to dream beyond the taxi. The Lyft shuttle was based on the intriguing idea of having their drivers run regular specific routes at specific times of day with specific stops at which several passengers could be picked up or dropped off. So like a bus? We should perhaps applaud Lyft for coming up with this bold new twist on the ride sharing concept, except of course that what we're describing here is essentially just a bus. Danny and I. It turns out that buses have been running for over a hundred years. So it's like an uncomfortable bus that might smell, I mean buses smell funny anyway, but like, the uncomfortable thing about this is like the worst thing about, being, at least the worst thing about me being in an Uber is like, I just want to sit in silence. 
I don't want to talk. And some drivers, and it's fine, like I understand, like it's not that I have anything against Uber drivers, I just have a thing against everyone. I don't want to chat. And I just want to like listen to an audiobook or crack through some emails or some social media and do something productive rather than talk about, I don't know, <laughs> what it's like to be an Uber driver. Um, or any other career. I'm not discriminating. I just don't care. So now you're just going to be stuck in a car and you don't even have the commonality of the subject about, so what, so what do we have in common? Well, we're in a lift together. <laughs> yeah, no, just take a regular lift. It's cheap anyway. One of the most unusual things about the lift shuttle concept is that it completely went against the grain of one of the building box blocks of the original ride sharing model, namely that it was a cheaper alternative to traditional taxis. Okay. In this case, the people of San Francisco and Chicago, where the scheme was originally trialed, were largely baffled to discover that using the lift shuttle platform was usually a lot more expensive than catching public transport. So it appears that the lift shuttle was essentially meant to be a new high-end deluxe version of the American bus service aimed at wealthier passengers who were far too posh to catch a bog-standard loser cruiser with the smelly ordinary people. Again, the main problem here is that nobody asked for such a service. Although, Danny, nobody asked for business plays. And it's actually turned out it's doing quite okay. Budget-conscious travelers would naturally stick to the more cost-effective method of just catching a bloody bus. While there'd be no reason at all for wealthier travelers to fit in with the schedule of a service that may well that they may well have to share with other passengers, they'd surely just book a standard private private Lyft or Uber ride. Following those brief trial runs in San Francisco and Chicago, Lyft very discreetly dropped the whole idea and pretended that it hadn't happened. Good, probably the probably for the best there. The Pavlock. Here in the UK, we call it Dragon's Den. American and Australian TV showers, viewers are more likely to know it as Shark Tank. I, f I just said that in, I, just a more American. I don't know why. I don't know, I didn't know this until recently, but both of these long running TV hit shows are actually based on an original Japanese format called Tigers of Money, which only ran for four years. That's quite a run. Also, Tigers of Money is the most badass name ever. Shark Tank, Dragon's Den. You should have just licensed the name. Tigers of Money. But whatever version you watch, we're essentially talking about the same show. A budding entrepreneur walks into a room, pitches his or her massively overvalued and completely unworkable business idea to a group of ruthless investors who proceed to tear the proposal to shreds for entertainment. It's glorious. Uh, if the entrepreneur is very lucky, he or she might walk away with an investment if they give up to a 90% stake in their business and the souls of their children. It's true. It's like Dragon's Den, the show where nobody gets exactly what they want. Life, the experience where nobody gets exactly what they want. Business Plays, the show where nobody gets exactly what they want. One particularly memorable moment popped up in 2016 edition of the US version of Shark Tank in which American inventor Manish Sethi uh, asked the sharks for an investment in his new Pavlok company and ended up getting verbally abused and sworn at until he left the room. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But first, there's no way I can play that because it's going to get claimed the shit out of. Uh, this, but first, let's take a look at that device that Manish's company was flogging and why it appears on this list. It's a device you can now buy if you're interested or if you just start craving bonkers. The Pavlok claims to be an award-winning wearable wait <coughs> an award-winning wearable device that releases a mild electric stimulus to help you reduce cravings break bad habits and increase your productivity good lord so it's basically a shock collar <laughs> so it's really just a relatively simple wristband with a button that releases up to 150 volts of zaptic feedback when pressed the idea is that whenever you find yourself about to engage in a negative habit such as reaching for a cigarette snorting a line of coke or watching a business blaze video come on what the Although I get the cocaine reference. Who doesn't love cocaine? Uh, you instead press the button and you give yourself an electric shock. That sounds a lot worse. It's like, what would you like to do, Simon? Have some cocaine or electrocute yourself? Uh... Your body is then meant to pair up the negative behavior with an unpleasant vibration. A concept not a million miles away from those cruel anti-bark dog collars, which are now thankfully banned in the UK, but are still perfectly legal in most countries. I didn't even know they were banned in the UK. It does seem like a good way to train a dog, though. Simon, dogs are people! They're not. The big di the difference is that the dog doesn't get a uh, smash that dislike button. By the way, Everyone was suggesting to have a t-shirt uh, at the merch store, which says smash the dislike button. Well, that is absolutely happening and coming soon. I'm particularly excited just about wearing it myself. The difference is that the dog doesn't get much say in when the collar administers the electric shock. The design flaw with the Pavlok is that it's entirely self-administered and therefore entirely pointless. If you have the willpower to press the button and shock yourself every time you go on the brink of indulging in a negative habit, surely you've got the willpower to just slap yourself in the face for free. Or even better, surely you'd have the willpower to just not indulge in the negative habit in the first place. Indeed, like, uh, I used to bite my fingernails, just put an elastic band on there, 
Anytime you bite your fingernails, just slap yourself with the elastic band, and it actually was quite effective. I think this, this could be actually... I mean, not a terrible invention if there was some way to like take the control out of the user. So for example, if you're checking your checking Facebook on your phone all the time, just link it in so that when the iPhone detects that the Facebook app has been opened on your phone, then it's just like, and you're like oh, okay, yeah, I forgot. Don't check Facebook or Reddit or whatever. That would actually work. Maybe some special case that you can put the cigarettes in so that when you open the case, it zaps you. Or just don't buy cigarettes. <laughs> or tie in with Google Maps so that when you go into a tobacconist or a shop that sells cigarettes, it just electrocutes the sh out of you and says like, buy your sh online and you won't be ordering the cigarettes, will you fool? Yeah, there you go, Manish. Problem solved. Go back to Dragon's Den. You're welcome. Send me a check in the mail. Most of the sharks in the tank weren't impressed by Seti's, Manish Seti's pitch for $500,000 for a 3.14% stake in his ludicrous company, which would make it worth about $15.9 million. It's a electric shock collar. Just buy one for a small dog. In fact, Manisha's TV appearance has gone down in history as one of the most arrogant pitches ever witnessed on the show. Now, that's not gonna help things. Shark, Mark Cuban, an actually rich and successful businessman with sensible ideas, went so far as to call Manisha con man because he had absolutely no clinical proof to back up his outlandish theories on Pavlovian conditioning. Amazingly, one of the other sharks did express an interest. Kevin O'Leary, otherwise known as Mr. Wonderful, who has quite an interesting YouTube channel, by the way, claimed that he had some belief in the confi and confidence in the concept and was ready to offer $500,000 as a loan with a 7.5% interest rate in return for 3.14% of the equity. Well, that sounds like a terrible deal. Yeah, I'll loan you $500,000 at a really high interest rate and I'll take the money. So I want more, it's a loan, and I get everything. But remember, this is Shark Tank, the show where nobody gets exactly what they want. Although it sounds like he'd get exactly what they want. However, Manish wasn't so keen on Mr. Wonderful, apparently because of the greedy, cruel, and belittling persona that he often displays on Shark Tank. <laughs> Manish announced that he'd be happy to take an offer from any of the other sharks just to get him the f*** out of here. Oh my god, dude, you're a f tool, aren't you? These are like successful dudes. Can you imagine being in that situation and being a dick to the people whose money you're asking for? It's like, hi, yeah, I'd really like a favor. I'm gonna be a complete knob. Manish dares to ask the other investors one last time if they have any interest before another blast of f you from Mr. Wonderful and leaving the room in defeat. I honestly don't think you'd get this kind of thing on the British version. You definitely wouldn't. I've never seen, I, I love the British version. I've never seen that. It's always like, uh, your idea is uh, incredibly unworkable and there's nothing good about it. And I think you're incredibly incompetent as a businessman. Okay, thank you. Um, I will take that into consideration moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, dragons. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. British Dragon's Den. Despite what appeared to be an embarrassing setback played out in public, the Pavlock device is now very much on sale. The release is available to rent. You pay a monthly subscription fee of around $30 and send it back when you've conquered your unhealthy addictions. If you're seriously thinking about signing up of these one for one of these things, just slap yourself in the face and keep slapping yourself for a very long time. I agree. This is so dumb. Oh God. What a Train wreck. Number whatever, I've totally lost track. Nine, maybe? Who cares? Smart luggage. I feel like just putting smart in front of something is like, that's a way to sell shit. Like, smart business place. Cures your stupidity. Uh, just a quick word here on an entire new industry rather than a particular product. We now are living in an ever developing landscape of smartphones, smart cars, smart fridges, smart doorbells, and even smart toilet roll holders. That last one is entirely serious, oh god. When the holder senses that your roll is running low, it emits a high-pitched beeping noise to warn you of the potential catastrophe about to unfold. I know Daddy's being sarcastic about that being a catastrophe, but sometimes it is. A cheaper alternative is just look at how much toilet roll is left on the roll. Yeah, agreed. However, I think this is actually not bad. Although I'd like it to automatically order me new toilet paper. But then it needs to count, okay, it needs to count how many, it needs to know, like did I buy a bag of 16, a box of, a packet of 16 toilet rolls. It needs to count how many times I've changed it since that order. And then when I get to the last one, just order me more automatically. That would be good. Am I fixing businesses today? This is, it's like, come on. It's not that hard. We now have Smart Luggage 2, which appears to be a growing market despite the fact that the Transport Security Administration, or TSA, seems determined to burst the bubble. One of the initial key features of first generation Smart Luggage was an inbuilt battery that would charge your phone while you were hanging around in your passenger lounge. That's gonna be an issue, because like, the amount of times it's been like, I've been curious, oh God, I forgot my brick. You know the battery brick? And they're like, sir, I need you to empty your bag. And it's like, oh God, what have I forgotten? 
and then it's like the giant battery. This is gonna be an issue. Can you remove these things? This may sound faintly useful, although it would have worked out far cheaper to just buy a simple external portable battery charger instead of forking out the sky-high prices for these clever suit cases. Yeah, like clever, smart. It's like, okay, so you put a battery in it. It's like, hang on. It's uh, this is this is a rechargeable battery. Uh, oh, this pocket's sewn shut. All, all my pockets are sewn shut except for the inside ones. This is now a uh, smart jacket. You wanna you want some more stuff? Yeah, that's a. That's a smart skull. I gotta really work on my merch. The idea was quickly killed off when the TSA enforced a strict ban on luggage containing batteries that couldn't be removed. And this decision took down several new smart luggage companies. Well, why not just make it removable? Is this really so hard? Some of the models could accurately weigh themselves, which I guess is kind of useful. Is it? Don't we all have scales? Also, just don't pack so much. It's not that hard. I can't remember the last time I went on holiday and checked luggage. Is it really necessary? Just launder your clothes on holiday. It's not, it's not hard. It's not hard. Other models featured, pr featured proximity alarms and locks that could only be opened by Bluetooth. Some of the wackier models could actually be ridden around the airport like a scooter. That sounds pretty awesome. Although many airlines were quick to stamp out this foolishness, while others were designed to follow you around like a loyal puppy so that you could keep your hands free as your luggage obediently trundles along after you. Because wheeling my luggage along is one of life's great difficulties. Not, that was sarcasm. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't feel hugely confident about the idea of my valuables mooching around a busy airport on their own accord. Yeah, you'd just be wandering along, assuming that your briefcase is following you, and you turn around and it's just gone. And like, well, either someone's nicked it, or it's just, you know, oh, out of Bluetooth, out of range. Can't do it anymore. And you can't help but feeling that the TSA will eventually come to the conclusion that wandering luggage could eventually prove to be a security risk. It could also be like a great, <laughs> it's like they find a suitcase that's got a bomb in it following you around. And you're like, no, 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 I'm not a terrorist. This isn't my luggage, this is following me around. <laughs> Uh, the main issue with smart luggage is that it all just seems like a bit of an expensive gimmick at the moment. Agreed. Many of the features aren't really that useful, some of them don't even work very well, and even the vaguely useful features can be achieved yourself with very little effort at a fraction of the cost. I'm not convinced that we've yet hit a point in our evolution cycle where there's been a desperate need to reinvent the suitcase. I agree. Rolling suitcases. We fixed it when we put the four wheels on them. Done. Even two-wheel ones are perfectly acceptable. I mean, the four-wheel thing was like a revolution, but I mean, they're pretty good. Clippy, finally, finally, we've come full circle. I think I go a little bit crazy at the end of these long ones. I don't know why I'm being so dramatic. To the most hated and ridiculed invention of all time, and bless him, he's only a little paperclip. You'd have thought that Microsoft might have learned a few valuable lessons with the cheesy cute fest that was Microsoft Bob. But you'd be wrong. Dead wrong. Jan Danny also seems to have gone a little crazy as he gets to the end. I'm sure anyone over the age of about 20-ish will have fond memories of Clippy. I am over the age of 20-ish and I do not. I mean, I have memories of him. They are not fond. <laughs> The interactive animated paperclip character that came packaged with Microsoft Word, uh, an assistant to guide you through whatever technically fiendish task you were bravely attempting to accomplish. Well, maybe not fond memories, but you'll certainly have memories. If you started writing a letter, Clippy would seize the opportunity to jump onto the screen. I described this entirely earlier, uh, and inform you that it looked like you were writing a letter and that you probably need some help with this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Clippy. F Clippy. Uh, if you tried to open your browser, Clippy would be straight on the scene, insisting that he help you with the navigation. He was in the browser as well? I don't even remember that. If you started trying to throw your computer out of a window in sheer frustration, good old Clippy would bounce back onto the screen, screaming, please don't kill- No, he wouldn't. He'd have recommended methods that would try to minimize back strain. Really? I mean, did he, re did he give that? I often feel Clippy was watching your every move and refusing to keep quiet about anything you were intending to do. More frustratingly, he would often prove to do nothing more than just distract you and delay the completion of a perfectly simple task. It's a bit like approaching a smart toaster, trying to shove in a few slices of bread, only for the toaster to split the, <laughs> split the toast right out, and while it bellows, Hi there, it looks like you're trying to make toast. Do you need any help with that? Uh, if you got that reference, thank you for being an OG Business Plays legend. It's quite mind-boggling that Clippy was introduced to the world just one year after Microsoft dropped the ball completely with Microsoft Bob. First appearing in the 1996 edition of Microsoft Word, the formal name of the title character is actually Clip It. It is? <laughs> Although he quickly adopted the name of Clippy. Designed by Kevin Atterbury, Clip It was just one of 15 proposals from a total of 250 submissions from graphic artists, all of whom were idiots. 
Uh, bearing in mind that Microsoft decided to go with a talking paperclip, you can only assume how bad the other 249 ideas must have been. The weird thing is that Microsoft went to the trouble of launching focus groups to assess the potential popularity of their clipper character, but then completely ignored all of the negative feedback. Most participants in the focus group just weren't particularly excited about an animated paperclip and found him deeply annoying. More worryingly, many of the women felt that it was quite sinister <laughs> and disturbing having a pair of leering male idols watching at every move. That's a bit sexist. Was Clippy necessarily a dude? His eyes were not particularly male. They were just eyes. It's classic sexism. It's 2019 women. Despite these early alarm bells, Microsoft went ahead and launched Clippy. It went on to irritate millions of users of Word for years and became a major source of embarrassment for Microsoft as his character was regularly lampooned and mocked on social media and television for his inherent uselessness. Perhaps the real problem was that poor old Clippy was clearly optimized for first use. You may well need a little bit of help and guidance using Microsoft Word for the very first time. You do? It's a word processor. Come on, it's not hard, is it? But you don't need the same character popping up on your hundredth session to guide you through something you mastered ages ago and continually bugging you until you finally figure out how to turn the damn thing off. It wasn't so much that people hated the character, everyone just hated how he behaved. Yeah, it's like, people don't hate me, they just hate my behavior. <laughs> So they do hate me. It actually took a surprisingly long time for Microsoft to get rid of Clippy, but this may partly be blamed on the fact that nobody dared approach Bill Gates about it. His wife, Melinda French, had been part of the team developing the original Microsoft Bob, which may have directly led to the development of Clippy. It's a bit of nepotism there, isn't it, Bill? Uh, by 2001, the character of Clippy had lost his status as a default setting in the new Office XP, and the company was happy to poke fun at themselves with a promotion or campaign which featured the comical adventures of a now unemployed Clippy, who believed that XP stood for X Paperclip. But -a -bum -bum it's not the same without the script, I don't even know how to do it. Oh, he finally disappeared from the Microsoft Store completely in 2007. One further cruel blow, he was briefly resurrected for one day in 2017 before swiftly getting axed again. Why Microsoft? Clippy resurfaced in a pack of fun animated digital stickers which were distributed for free to users of Microsoft Teams. Oh, that's kind of nice, I get it. Like, it's 10 years. However, it's believed that upper management at Microsoft had not been consulted about this move and weren't particularly happy about the return of their most derided creation of all time. Oh, it's okay. We can have a bit of humor about it, can't we? If this iPad, which has nothing to do with Microsoft, just popped up with a clippy one day for one day, I'd be like, that's kind of fun, and then I'd throw it out. No, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, the stickers were hastily pulled the following day. Despite all of this, Clippy wasn't hated by everyone. Yeah, he was. Who is this guy? Come on. Several online communities still fiercely petition for the return of Clippy, and he even inspires erotic fanfiction amongst some particularly strange circles. I don't believe it, but I do believe it because it's the internet, and yeah, of course. What's that rule where if it's like, <laughs> there's porn out there with Clippy? If you're that way inclined, check out Conquered by Clippy. Oh god, really? No. No! <laughs> by Lena Delaney, the same genius author behind Taken by the Tetris Blocks. Oh god. I once saw a... Uh, uh, <laughs> What was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on like, I don't know, Twitter or whatever. It was a book called Taken by the T-Rex. And I'm like, oh shit, we're in different, different league of shit now. So maybe it's not entirely impossible that Clippy might one day make a triumphant comeback. Let's hope not. Maybe he will get his own animated series, blockbuster movie franchise, range of toys. Danny forgets to mention pornography series. Uh, who knows? Stay tuned to your radio newspaper to keep in the loop. This has been Business Blaze. This has got to be over an hour. If you're watching to the end like this, you're an absolute legend. Thank you. Buy this t-shirt. Uh, there is more t-shirt. I've been listening to your suggestions. I'm in talks with our merch company. They're making a whole bunch of stuff that is crazy and stupid. And if you guys buy it, I'll be amazed, but I'm going to enjoy wearing it. <laughs> um, that's it. I'm going to sit my ass down. Thank you for watching. Someone would be like, Simon, I got you a tricycle. I'd be like, have you confused me for a child?